All right. Good morning, Tacoma. Good morning, Tacoma. Ah, it's great to be here today. People ask me all the time, what on earth do people wear when they go to a place like the Antarctic? Well, it's a whole lot more fun and a whole lot more effective to show you as opposed to telling you. I mean, imagine trying to describe to you in words what a 12-pound Canadian goose down coat is like. <laughs> now, of course, I'm not going to wear this the entire time, but I also wear this gear to make a point that has everything to do with being a leader. And that's this. When you go into a place like the Antarctic, where you've got elements and you've got threats and, and the like, it's important to take proactive measures to guard against the enemy. In the same way, if we're going to be effective as leaders, if we're going to be effective as salespeople, we have to be proactive. We have to take measures within our control to guard against the elements that can steal and threaten our success. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, I have to make a comment about last night. Those, I'm going to call them circus performers, were absolutely amazing. And I don't know when those people were booked if Stacy and the folks who planned the conference understood the correlation between what those folks were doing and what it takes to be an effective leader. I was thinking about this as that guy was on that thing they called the German wheel, right, where he's spinning around and, and he's moving in micrometers of, of, of increments of, of uh, distance to make sure his precision and his balance and his attention to detail had to be really, really right on. And I thought to myself, you know, if we're dealing with customers and we're helping them with staffing issues and solving problems, our attention to detail, our level of precision, our degree of strength is equally as important to engaging and keeping that customer as it was for the guy on the German wheel to make sure that the act went as planned. Speaking of attention to detail, I was in a conversation last night with one of the award winners. She's the gal from Plain Tech who won the, what was it, the salesperson of the year? That was Lindsay. Where's Lindsay, by the way? Where's Lindsay? Oh, there she is. She's right over there. And I asked Lindsay an, uh, an interesting question. I said, tell me about one of your more uh, interesting sales stories that really demonstrates you know, your effectiveness as a salesperson. She said, well, it was one of my first customers. What happened was I called this guy on the phone. I think he was in Alabama. Right, Lindsay? OK. So she calls the guy on the phone to get an appointment. And he's proceeding to tell her, he's a very nice guy, and he's proceeding to tell her, well, you know, I've been doing business with some companies for a while, and they're doing a good job, and they're my friends. Now, you put yourself in the shoes of a salesperson. When a potential customer says, we have a great relationship, they're my friends, right? Most salespeople will be like, oh, I get it, you know. Do you mind if I stay in touch? And, you know, that kind of typical route of, of a sales call when you hear that. Not Lindsay. Lindsay's attention to detail, her ability to listen at a very acute level was really clicking on all cylinders. Lindsay's response was this, oh, I can be your friend too. <laughs> she got the appointment, she got the sale, and she still has that account four years later. Give Lindsay a hand. <laughs> Way to go, Lindsay. Well, welcome to Leading at 90 Below Zero. 90 below zero. You've seen in the, in the news recently, right, the, the upper Midwest of the US is in this deep freeze. Bring in the dogs, lock up the kids. You know, it's, it's changing our lives. Up in Canada, it got a lot worse. It was minus 38 degrees Fahrenheit last night in Churchill, Manitoba. I was so wishing you guys would have had the conference in Churchill. <laughs> you picture 90 below zero. Like, what comes to your mind? By the way, what you see behind you is a picture of the coldest place on the planet. It's called Vostok. It's in the eastern part of the Antarctic. Minus 129.4 degrees Fahrenheit, actual real ambient temperature. Many of the conditions in the Antarctic are parallel to what we face in the real world. You picture that. We're going to talk about this today. When you go into these conditions intentionally, to try to go from one place to the other, and managing detail, and managing change, and managing all of the elements that come up. 
is so parallel to what we do as leaders every single day as we're partnering with companies to address the staffing issues, right? We got to be really ready. Ready mentally, physically, emotionally, and in ways that you don't even know you have to be ready. You've got to be incredibly emotionally engaged. You've got to be locked in on an emotional level, level with those customers and with the needs that they're bringing to your attention, right? We've got to be authentic, always, because people are watching. Steve alluded to that last night. People are interviewing us as much as we're interviewing them. We have to really be authentic, right? And lastly, we're going to talk about leaving a legacy. Being real is the difference. This was alluded to yesterday, right? Real people getting real work done. Every single one of us, whether we're an entry-level person and we're the newest employee at True Blue, or whether we're the most tenured at a higher level, every single one of us in every role is called to be a leader at all times. And sometimes the impact of your leadership is just setting an example for somebody that you don't necessarily manage, who's not necessarily your customer, but they're watching. And it makes a big difference. Now, of course, I'm sure this is not a surprise to you. We're going to illustrate these points and these principles in a very different and unusual way. We're going to talk about this through the context of stories from what I consider the greatest place in the world, which is the Antarctic. 500 million years, 90% of all the ice on the planet. The average ice shelf on the Antarctic is more than one mile thick. It submerges the landmass by more than a half a mile. This is a picture of some of the elements that you face in the Antarctic. They're called catabatic winds, 100, 150 miles an hour, right? Do we have forces that push against us every single day, right? Forces that we can't control, like the economy, our competition, right? I know some of the industries that you cater to are somewhat cyclical or somewhat up and down, like the steel business. I heard that last night, right? I mean, it goes up and down. That's a force that pushes against you. Speaking of ice shelf, this is a picture of the edge of the continent, right? Barriers that we face, many barriers that we face. Sometimes the biggest barriers we face are internal. Some of the biggest challenges we sometimes face are from within. We have to manage those, right? Kim alluded to this when she introduced me. Change that is often sudden, unexpected, and unwelcomed. It happens every day in the Antarctic, and it happens every single day in dealing with the customers and dealing with each other. And this is probably one of the biggest challenges in the Antarctic, is the isolation factor. These explorers would go down there, not for days and weeks, but for months and years. Some of these expeditions went three, four, five years. And when you're that cut off from the real world, it becomes a mental game. We're going to talk about these muscles up here, because these muscles are the most important to condition as a leader, to make sure we stay the course and we're able to follow through and finish what it is what we, just, what we start and deliver value to the customer. Now, of course, the biggest question I get is this. Why Antarctica? And what does it have to do with me and my business? The answer is in this photograph right here. This was a photograph on the cover of a book that I walked past at a Barnes & Noble bookstore in Bakersfield, California in 2001. I was on a staffing trip. My background since 1997 has been in the staffing industry. We used to sell job fairs to companies that were hiring salespeople. We sold them in 40 or 50 cities across the country. In fact, Labor Ready was one of our key customers. They bought more than 100 events a year, which was really big. We only produced about 130 events in a year. Labor Ready bought most of them. Not to find people to place for clients for their own internal purposes, only salespeople to put more people on the street to make more phone calls and knock on more doors. They were gobbling up salespeople faster than kids gobble up pizza at a party. And they were deploying these people and they were growing like wild. Some of you, I know, Wayne, I was talking to Wayne yesterday, I know he was around during those times when the company was just absolutely exploding. So I'm on this trip in Bakersfield and I see this book. And it's a story about this guy named Shackleton. And it said, this greatest Antarctic explorer ever, and he's one of the greatest leaders of all times, and it's, it was a business book. And of course, I didn't understand the correlation between this guy, that photograph, and the whole concept of being a leader in a business. So I thought, well, there's only one way to answer that question, right? You've got to buy the book, and you've got to read it. So I'm standing there in the aisle, and I'm still determining 
whether or not I'm going to buy the book. And I came across this quote and said Shackleton was often quoted as saying things like this. I love it when things are hard and I hate it when things are easy. And I thought, well, he's not dyslexic. I mean, he probably got this right. This was probably by design. What does he mean by this? And then I started thinking about it. Now, wait a minute. This guy intentionally went into conditions between difficult and dangerous, intentionally. And his goal was to go from one place to the other and manage all these obstacles and hazards and things along the way. And I thought to myself, you know what? I want to work for a guy like this. I wish my sales manager thought more like this. The greatest candidates in the world are attracted to that kind of thinking. The greatest performers in the world who are probably doing a job at a high level right now that we really want access to to make sure that our clients can take advantage of those folks think like this. It's critically, critically important. So I started literally transposing this guy's mindset into the real world and I instantly saw the parallel. So I became really hooked. I bought that book and then I read another one and then I went crazy and I've, I've got, I don't know, I have 100 or 150 books on the subject now. My wife thinks I just absolutely went AWOL. Well, it wasn't really until I decided to run a marathon in the Antarctic that she really thought I was crazy. I, I, I went to a friend of mine and I said, listen, I really want to speak about this subject. I'm really compelled by these guys and what they did and I see the connection to the real world. So this is a guy I had never met. We didn't have Skype back then, and I didn't know what he looked like, and I got referred to this guy because he was an author. So he says to me, wait, you've got to go to the Antarctic. You've got to somewhat have a taste of what these guys did 100 years ago. So I signed up for this Mary. I said, yeah, this guy's right. I can't pick him out of a police lineup, but he's right. So I came home that day, and I said, guess where I'm going? <laughs> I hadn't run a marathon in 20 years. So I want to go back to Shackleton just for a minute. This is a very interesting photograph. We're going to get into Shackleton, and we're going to really see what he saw. We're going to walk in his shoes. Your job this morning is to understand the drivers and the points of the story and extrapolate them and connect them to the dots in your world. And I'm going to help you do that. But I want you to learn to read between the lines, because this is not a program for athletes or people who like cold weather. I realize that's a very, very small segment of the population. But the points applicable to your world, that now includes all of us. This photograph is a very interesting photograph about Shackleton. This was taken several years before he launched the Endurance Expedition, which is what we're going to get into. But this photograph was shot 97 miles from the South Pole. This, no human being at this point had ever been there. Getting to the South Pole first was, in that day and age, the equivalent of putting a man on the moon. It was that significant, especially for the country of England. And so Shackleton plans this trip. He had already been on one previous expedition that failed, and he got fired. And now he organizes his own trip. And now he's got an opportunity to be the first human being at the bottom of the world. They get 97 miles from the pole. That's 700 miles inland. So they sail 12,000 miles from England. They have already hiked 700. I mean, they're like 98%, I, whatever the math is, right? They're very close to their goal. And Shackleton says, stop. We're turning around and we're going home. His guys looked at him like, are you out of your mind? What do you mean we're going home? We got good weather, we got supplies, we're feeling good. You're going to be a rock star. And we're going to be the groupies that are following you. <laughs> and he says, here's the reason why we're going back. I'm concerned that we don't have enough supplies for the return trip. You see, it's not like when they get to the South Pole, they hop on the one-way Southwest plane and hop back to South America, right? They got to go all the way back. So he was very concerned about the margin of safety. Much like you pay attention to the margin of safety, you have to be conservative. You have to think objectively when it comes to issues of safety. Can't let your emotions rule. Imagine the emotions if you're in that situation. This is a hallmark of a great leader. You see, the irony is, is that it takes somewhat of an ego to be a leader at a high level. But an ego is much like a steroid. If it's used intentionally and it's managed properly, it really becomes a catalyst to being able to do great things. Much like a steroid, if it's used properly, it saves people's lives. But if it's mismanaged and abused, it destroys people's lives. We've seen that, right? In the same way with our ego. Shackleton refused to succumb to what we might know as summit fever. You may have heard that term before, when these men and women climb like places like Mount Everest. 
and they're going up. You remember the story of uh, Scott Fisher in 1996? There was a famous book written called Into Thin Air by John Kruckauer. I think John's from Seattle, if I'm not mistaken. And right, Scott took this group of people up, and they become so fixated on getting to the top at all costs that they lose their sense of objectivity, and they lose their ability to make good decisions and manage the people around them. Shackleton refused to give in to that. He made sure the ego was in check. So they turned around. They almost didn't make it, but they got back. It's an amazing picture of his character. Now there's a race to the South Pole. Shackleton is actually beat. These two teams, led by Amundsen, the guy on the left, and Robert Scott, the guy on the right. He's the British guy who originally had the first expedition to the Antarctic that failed and that fired Shackleton. So these two guys make it to the South Pole. And that's a very interesting story in its, of itself. If you're a fan of business books, you may have read Jim Collins' new book called Great by Choice. He uses this metaphorical analogy to illustrate the point about discipline. And his whole point about this is discipline is not just what you do, it's what you don't do. And he's alluding to the Amundsen team, who is very consistent. He calls this the 20-mile march principle meaning their average daily mileage was not going to go more than 20 miles. Even if they got to 20 miles and they felt good and the weather was good and they could continue on, no. The consistency, the discipline of saying no to doing more on that day was, gonna hurt, was really critical to their success. Whereas the Scott team, on the other hand, was erratic in their mileage. They were all over the map and they ended up dying. And it was a very tragic story, so it's a great book to read. So Shackleton's goal now is attained by someone else. So he says, great, congratulations, guys. We're going to the next level. I'm now organizing a team that's going to go not just to the South Pole, but through it and to the other side. We're going across the whole continent, 1,800 miles. People were like, what? <laughs> and again, I'm standing there in this bookstore, and I'm getting this picture. And I'm seeing this, and I'm thinking, why isn't my boss more like this? Why isn't my company more like this? And you recruiters know, when you talk to really good employees who are doing work at a high level, they love this kind of thinking. They want to come to a company that says, you know what? We're going to do things in our industry that have never been done. We're going to engage our people and solve problems and create value in ways that nobody has ever done before in our industry. You see, that's the challenge. The challenge for us is doing things like this that have never been tried by anyone in the staffing industry. We constantly have to reinvent ourselves and raise the bar. So Shackleton recruits his team of 28 people. And on August 5th, 1914, the dawn of World War I, they leave. They leave England. And so what happens is they sail down, and they're 20 miles from their goal. That's 2-0. That's not very far relative to the 12,000 miles they just sailed. So they get stuck. And so they have to be very patient. And so the 28 guys literally set up camp on the ice. There's nothing they can do. Now, of course, when the ship gets stuck, the knee-jerk reaction is to start sawing. Much like when we run into problems and obstacles, there are certain knee-jerk reactions we have to solving certain problems. Now, you can see here that this looks a little bit futile. The ice is averaging almost six feet thick. And it's actually forming at a faster rate than they can saw. right? So Shackleton let his guys kind of go on a little bit. And then he made a point. He did this, I think, to teach them something very interesting. And this stems back to the photograph that was on the cover of the book. That book, by the way, is called Shackleton's Way by a gal named Margot Morell. Great, great, great book if you haven't read it. So what he did was, he said, guys, listen, the greatest threat we face is not the weather, it's not the lack of food, it's not the fact that the ship is stuck. The single greatest threat that we face is the lack of our minds not staying engaged and moving forward at all times. And I thought to myself, isn't that true in the world of leaders today? The greatest threat we face at True Blue, the greatest threat that our customers, who we're partnering with to solve staffing issues, the greatest threat they face and those workers face is when their minds are not engaged and staying in a forward moving progress at all times. And the irony of this picture is you have an example. That's why he created things like soccer games, things that he had control over. You see, this photograph teaches us something very important. 
And if you want to get real mileage out of this, this is in the public domain, by the way, so we're not infringing on any copyright issues. You ought to download it and blow it up and put it in a frame and put it on your wall. What it teaches us is you have an example of, look at the ship on the upper right. That's an example of something that is a factor that's totally out of your control. Right? As good as you are, as hard as you try, it's not moving. The soccer game is an example of something you have 100% of control over. You can do it or not do it. And so separating the factors that you can control from those that you can't is one of the greatest moves that a leader can make. We have to manage people's activities. We have to manage the hard drive space. Many people, especially us salespeople, we stay up at night. We fill up our hard drive space. We waste the time on the clock. Pushing against walls will never move. Sawing ships out of the ice that will never become free. Is the customer going to buy? What about my competition? Right? All of these factors are examples of ships in the ice. As leaders, we have to help people separate those particular factors. So they're stuck. So Shackleton manages the crew in some amazing ways that really showcases his ability to be a great, great leader. One of the things is depicted in this particular photograph. The officers and the crew members were totally together. See, British custom in the Royal Navy was to separate the officers and the crew members, a very strong line of division between those two classes. They, were, they ate in separate quarters. They slept in separate quarters. They had different uniforms. Shackleton said, no way. Everybody's on an equal playing field, period. This was really breaking the mold. This was really radical. And he said, yes, everybody has individual responsibilities and roles and is accountable in different ways. But when it comes to what we're entitled to and how we're going to be treated, we're all going to be the same. And he managed that. And as leaders today, we have to make sure we manage some of the lines that can create division between classes of people. We have to be very careful about that. He managed the relationships. He managed the friendships. One of the hallmarks of this guy's ability to be a great leader was he made sure people had solid friendships amongst the team members. He managed that to the high hilt. Recognition and celebration was a huge part of Shackleton's arsenal as a leader to make sure he got the best out of his people, right? He made sure that, I mean, it, it relates to one of the points that you're your foundation is built on, right? Encouraging the heart, right? Really celebrating, celebrating risk, celebrating success, celebrating wins and losses, celebrating and learning from things. Recognition and celebration is one of the greatest forms of leverage that a leader has. Shackleton made sure he allowed more room on the ship and more room in the budget to put things like costumes and phonographs and other things. This is actually an example of a holiday that he invented called Midwinter's Day Celebration. It just basically meant the sun was at its furthest point from the Earth, and now it's on its way back, because it's dark in the Antarctic for four months. So it becomes very, very difficult mentally. And so he says, hey, let's have a party. Sun's at its furthest point. It's on its way back. Let's have a party, right? I mean, he really, he really understood that. This guy was extremely passionate about what he was doing, but he was also incredibly compassionate. And this is a hallmark of a great leader, right? Being passionate about what you do and also being compassionate for those who you do it for, right? Passion is being incredibly emotionally engaged in the things we do. Being compassionate is being incredibly emotionally engaged for the people who we do it for, each other and our customers. When it's about somebody other than ourselves and it's about our customers, you'll get a lot more of what you need in the long run. It'll just be a byproduct. You won't even have to ask for it. It'll just show up. So here's the plan. The ship is stuck, and they're not in danger at this point. So when the ice would melt, then they could proceed. And this was sort of the plan of action of most of the polar expeditions, whether they were up north or up south. These ships were built to withstand that kind of pressure. So the ice starts to melt. That's the good news. The bad news is, is that now the ship is starting to list which means it's going on its side, <laughs> and you don't want that, OK? So the previous photo was by design. That's kind of not in the plan. But again, it's a factor beyond their control, right? That as good as they are or as hard as they try, can't do anything about it. And of course, imagine if the ice can sink a landmass by a half a mile, what it can do to a ship. Well, here's an evidence of what it actually did to the ship, right? 
it actually crushed this thing. And so now they pulled off three of the lifeboats and some of the supplies, and they're stuck. They're in the middle of the Weddell Sea. And they called this Camp Patience, ironically enough, right? Because sometimes, just like the old Tom Petty song says, waiting is the hardest part. And that's true in our world today. We can do everything right. We can set everything in motion and ask the right questions and do the right things. And we have to wait. And we have to wait. And we don't know what the answer is going to be. Just like these guys 100 years ago in the middle of nowhere. One of the interesting things that is noted in the journals of the men, this is where the naked truth is recorded. You think about a journal, right? You're going to write things in the journal that you think nobody's going to read. So there are no inhibitions. I'm just going to say it like it really is, and I'm not going to worry about the consequences because no one's going to see it. Well, we've recovered these journals. And one of the interesting things you note is the parallel amongst the 27 men that talks about the example that Shackleton sets. Right? I know this is another one of the pillars that your organization is built on, setting the example, leading the way. People watch what you do more than they listen to what you say whether you're an Antarctic guy 100 years ago or whether you're leading a team of people or engaging with a group of customers. It's the exact same principle, just in a different context. Shackleton was often noted as being the guy to go to bed the latest and be up the soonest. He was often the one who would volunteer sooner rather than later for the difficult parts of the job, like in this photograph here, which is the all-night watch. They had to have somebody staying up 24-7. Remember, they're in the middle of the ocean. And if you've ever been on a big body of water that's frozen, it moves, regardless of the temperature. And there's orcas out there, and there's threats, and leads open up. So somebody has to watch. So Shackleton now gathers his guys around in a semicircle. Picture this. You're the leader. You have 27 of your people in front of you. And you say, gang, the rules of the game are changing. The conditions have changed. We're going to tact and make a different, different turn in our strategy here. And what he did at this point was he called for a sacrifice of the personal possessions of the men, meaning that he limited it to two pounds per man. They had a lot of stuff, costumes and phonographs and all this other stuff. And so they ended up sacrificing many things, including about 300 photographs. These photographs that you see were part of a collection of about 150 that made it out. There were 300 of them on glass negatives that he made Frank Hurley, the photographer, shatter and destroy so he would not be able to turn back and take them with him. Imagine what those photographs look like. Then he said, okay, I'm going to go first. And he started discarding items in front of the men, like gold coins, a cigarette case that was inscribed with his initials. And then he threw a Bible on the ice that the Queen of England had signed and had given to him. And he looked at his men and he said, if you think that was hard, you haven't seen anything yet because the bar is now going way up. Yeah. The animals have to go. And they started with Mrs. Chippy the cat and four puppies. And in the ensuing weeks to come, he made each man put down his own set of dogs. Each, each guy tended to about four or five dogs. And you know, if you think about this, I, and I know that's hard to hear, and I've had people cry. When, I mean, I had one lady one time who had just literally put her dog down. And in a group this size, somebody either may have recently done that or may have to. I had to put a cat down a couple of years ago. My first cat, he was 18. I mean, I cried for a month. It was really hard. You become very attached. But as a leader, we have to make sure that we don't let our emotions and our feelings rule our ability to make good decisions. The reason they did this was because the amount of food it took to feed both the men and the animals for one day sustained the men for one week. So yes, it's a balance. You get some value out of the animals, measured in a number of ways. But you also have a price to pay, i.e. the amount of food that can sustain the men. And so as a leader today, we have a finite amount of resources, money and time and manpower and all these other things that are limited, like the food supply they had. And sometimes as leaders, we have to sacrifice and make decisions that hurt. We have to give things up that cost us something. And a lot of times, if the sacrifice doesn't hurt, it's really more of an inconvenience than a true sacrifice. You want to really engage your people. You want to lead your people to higher levels. When they see you really sacrifice things and lead the way in that regard, their level of appreciation for you and their willingness to follow you and work harder just took another jump up, regardless of where it started. 
And that was one of the keys to what Shackleton did. So they, they, they go through this, they pulled the boats off, and now they got to get a break in the open ice so they're not going to get out of there. So it's around March now of 1915. They haven't been on land for a very long time. So they literally now got a break in the ice and they launched these three lifeboats. Three days and three nights. When they got to Elephant Island, that's the good news. They're on land for the first time in 497 days. The bad news, nobody knows where they are. They're not in a shipping lane. There won't be a flyover. <laughs> they don't have a Garmin. And the Iridium phone wasn't around then. So <laughs> they got to get out of there. This is April of 1915. I'm sorry, 1916. They got to get out of here, OK? So Shackleton decides he's going to leave the 22 guys behind. And he's going to take five people, including a guy named Timothy McNeish. Timothy was the carpenter. He was also the most hard-headed and difficult person to manage on the crew. Shackleton refused to pawn him off to somebody else. He said, I will take personally responsibi personal responsibility to manage the most difficult guy. Again, another example where he's not going to you know, push something that's difficult onto somebody else. He's going to do the things that are most difficult, including managing the most difficult person. So they launched the boat, 17 days and nights. Okay, They were at this point, they're in the tip of the peninsula of the Antarctic. If you picture a map of the Antarctic on the, on the north side, it's got a little peninsula with a bunch of islands. Like South America is about 400 miles that way. They couldn't go to South America because it was going against the current of the Southern Ocean, which is the roughest ocean in the world. If you've ever taken a cruise to the Antarctic, you know what I'm talking about. So they had to go in a direction to the east. So they decided to go back to South Georgia, which is the island that they originally had departed from. It's 800 miles, 17 days and nights. There's a book written just about this 17 day and night journey. I could stand here for an hour and give you an incredibly amazing list of details and points that have everything to do with the real world just from that 17 day and night journey. It's amazing when you drill down into these stories and you start reading the stories within the story, how compelling it is and yet how eye-opening it is of how it actually has application to the real world. So the good news, they get to South Georgia. The bad news, <laughs> they're on the wrong side of the island. And again, it's not like you can take the ferry or the helicopter and just go on over, right? Three of the six guys at this point are exhausted beyond description. Shackleton said, you guys have earned it, sleep in. Again, I as the leader will take responsibility for the difficult part of the job. I'm going to take my two best guys and we're going to go get help. 36 straight hours. Now you got to keep in mind, this is after being at sea in a 23 foot dinghy in the roughest ocean in the world for 17 days and nights. Oh yeah, after drifting around the Weddell Sea for 497 days. Oh yeah, and that was after sailing 12,000 miles from England on the dawn of World War I. Right, you start to put this in the right timeline and you go, this is unbelievable that these guys could do this. 36 straight hours, 22 miles, they crossed the entire island of South Georgia. No one had ever been more than one mile into the interior of this island before. There were no maps, there were no compasses, they just had to go by line of sight. Miraculously, they made it. Now they have to go get the guys back on Elephant Island. Remember, they left 22 people 800 miles behind. So it took four attempts to get them because, remember, this is our summer, which is their winter, since they're in the southern hemisphere. They finally, on the fourth attempt, are able to rescue these guys in August of 1916. They show up and all 22 people are still alive. It's an amazing story. Shackleton says, I'm not finished. I'm going again. Seven people from this group of 27 voluntarily and willingly signed up for this. World War I was still going on, by the way. Seven people signed up. OK, so Shackleton's got to get a little bit of objective help. So this is a guy named Alexander Macklin. He was one of the crew members. He's a surgeon. He was one of the officers. He pulls him aside and he says, Shaq, <laughs> dude, you're 47. You've already had a heart attack. You got a wife and two kids back in England who desperately need you and love you. You got to give this, you got to get a real job, dude. <laughs> right? Shackleton says, hey, doc, let me ask you a question. You tell me what it is that you want me to give up. You see, Shackleton didn't know any other way. That was the last thing he ever said. He went to bed that night on January 5th, 1922. He died of a heart attack while sleeping at 2.30 in the morning in the birth quarters on the ship in the port of South Georgia 
prior to the launching of the Quest expedition, which was his fourth venture into the Antarctic. See, when Shackleton asked him the question, what do you tell me what I, what I need to give up? I mean, he looked at him like, is this a trick question? You see, what's interesting about Shackleton, being an explorer is not something he did. It was an extension and reflection of who he was. And there is a big difference. If we're going to hit on all cylinders, if we're going to lead our people successfully, if we're going to engage our customers to the point where they say, you know what, I'll pay more for True Blue because I see the value. I see the people being engaged. Our people need to do what they do every day, and it needs to be an extension and reflection of who we are, not a job we do. Now, of course, some days we understand we're human. Some days it's just a job. Some days it's like pushing a stone up the hill. That should be the exception rather than the rule. And if it's not, we're in the wrong role. We're in the wrong seat on the bus or we're on the wrong bus, right? We have to make sure we're really, really, really clicking on all cylinders. Shackleton absolutely did that. And of course, there's the quote. What is it that you really want me to give up, Doc? This is the last surviving member of the party on the Antarctic expedition that Shackleton led, the Endurance Expedition. This is Lionel Greenstreet. He died in 1979. Lived a very long time. He was into his 90s. They interviewed him before he died, and he said, hey, most of these expeditions failed. You guys made it. What was the difference? He looks at him, and he said two words. Ernest Shackleton. Right? Shackleton helped his people to see themselves and to see the world differently. That was a quote from a professor at UW in Seattle in Margot Morell's book. Great definition of a leader. You know, it's interesting. Our people are looking to us in the same way that Lionel Greenstreet looked to Ernest Shackleton. I had a placement of a candidate about six months ago. I was tracking this guy for two years. He was a top performer, working for a great company, making a lot of money. He had no reason to leave. I called him every six months. You recruiters, you get that, right? Finally, I called him in March, and he said, I'm ready to listen. Oh, what happened? It was a football that the leaders fumbled. That they really, it's amazing. When you, when you end up getting the attention of a good worker, and they're thinking about making a change, it's usually only about four or five different reasons as to why they're willing to change, right? And so Mark says, I'm ready to, I'm ready to talk. So I set him up with an interview with a company in Houston. He gets on the phone with a couple of the people, including a guy named Lee Clark, who is the CEO. Phone call goes great. Lee sends him a plane ticket. He, Mark flies to Houston. They spend the day together. That was the plan. So I call Mark the next day after he got home, and he was through with his interview with Lee Clark, the CEO of US Signs. And, I, and Mark said, yeah, it was a great day. I go, oh, anything else? I mean, Ma Mark's one of these monotone guys. He's not real electrifying. He's one of the most unassuming sales guys you'd ever meet, but he's very effective. He said, I'm ready to go to US Signs. I said, wow, congratulations. What was the difference? He paused and he said two words, Lee Clark. People are watching, whether it's Lionel Greenstreet 100 years ago in the middle of nowhere, or it's Mark Simcox watching Lee Clark. It's the same important drivers and principles that we've talked about here today that were exhibited by Shackleton. Amazing. So I decide to follow in his footsteps. I sign up for this marathon, right? I commit to this thing from this guy on the phone named Greg Godak, who I couldn't pick out of a police lineup. But then I hung the phone up, and I went, OK, wait a minute. I live in San Diego. <laughs> My wife's not going to move to Canada. How do we get ready for this? I mean, last week, it was like 38 degrees in San Diego. And I mean, it was front and center news. People were like, oh, man, the ice age is coming back. What are we going to do? I'm thinking, that's not going to get it done for the Antarctic. So I literally started making phone calls out of the yellow pages. Some of you have been around long enough to know what those are. <laughs> and I'm like, do you look under the word F for freezer, I for ice, you know, N for nutcase? I'm like, where do you go? You got to know where to look in this thing, right? So I finally, I literally started calling every single phone number and company listed under the word freezer. I mean, you should have heard the responses on the other line. I'm like, I, I want to run in this marathon. You, I was on a radio show. You may have heard it. I, committed to this thing. I haven't run a marathon in 20 years. I love this guy named Shackleton, and I want to run in your freezer. I mean, that was like literally what it was. And I mean, there was like this pause on the other end of the line. I had people say things to me like, well, pff, 
I, I, I'd love to help you. I don't know if you can fit in my stuff. I make ice machines for hotels if you want to cram yourself in there and hang out for a day or two. I mean, I had no idea who I was calling, right? And so I end up in this place after about a month. Uh, I end up in this place called Miramar Cold Storage. Turns out the owner of the freezer used to own a business in the Antarctic. I'm like, what did you do down there, right? Turned out he was an engineer. He had an engineering company that built what they called the closed loop system for all the water and diesel fuel at McMurdo, which is the biggest research facility on the continent. So after I heard this, I'm like, oh yeah, Tibor, I knew he, his name was Tibor. He hardly spoke English, he was from Hungary, so I, that was a big issue too. It was a, it was a very difficult task to get into this freezer. So here's a picture of the freezer, 59 feet at a time. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. There's a ton of value that I learned as a salesperson from that freezer that I'm gonna get to in just a minute. There's another picture of the freezer, sometimes we'd change it up. You know, if the pallets were all enclosed in me and I couldn't run, I'd have to just sit on the spin bike for hours and just sit there and pedal in the, you know, 10 degree below zero weather. So, show you a couple pictures from the Antarctic. This is the um, plane that we took down. So I trained in the freezer for about a year. Then I end up flying there on this Russian cargo plane that lands on an ice strip. No brakes, no windows on the plane. <laughs> the best carnival ride of your life. So there's nine of us, right? And uh, not like you're going to get lost in the crowd. That's the entire race field right there. That's it. Now, what's interesting is when we started, they warned us. They said, listen, if the weather changes, and it could, uh, it's going to be a mental game. Because everything is going to look kind of like the same, and you won't even see the horizon. Now, the weather has to be good to start. They can't get the plane in otherwise. Because if there's no contrast, they don't have depth perception. They can't land the plane. So it had to have a high degree of detail and contrast on the ground to start. So you can see that when we started, it was great. Now, of course, the Antarctic weather is more volatile than that along the front range. I used to live in Colorado, and you know they say if you don't like the weather, wait a minute or two and it'll change. It really changes fast in the Antarctic. So this is exactly what happened. Now you can see the clouds are coming in, and the level of detail is now starting to go down. And it gets worse, and it gets worse, and then finally, look at that. Now I want you to picture this for a minute. Don't shout out any numbers. You see those two characters in the background? And you see the banner there, the finish line? I want you to think for a minute, how far do you think those two guys are from the finish line? Don't shout it out. Maybe you write down a number. I don't care if it's in inches, miles, light years, marathons, feet, whatever. Just a number and a unit of measure. I want you to think of one. All right, how far do you think they are? Let's get some answers here. Shout out, what do you got? One mile? Two miles. Anybody got less than two miles? How far? 100 feet? Anybody less than 100 feet? Is that the smallest number in the room? 100 feet. OK, our variance now is 100 feet to two miles. That's quite a variance. Anybody higher than two miles? Your instinctive thought, what do you got? H higher than five miles. Anybody think it was further than five miles? No? 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 OK, 100 feet to five miles. That is a quite a variance. The real answer is they're about 200 yards, OK? Now, don't feel bad. I had one lady one time, 20 miles. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, so if they were like a little bit that way, that would be like the whole marathon, right? That's 26. Don't feel bad. The whole point is it's very difficult to judge forward progress when you can't see signs of progression you would normally associate with those activities at that pace level. And I thought to myself, isn't this true for salespeople especially? Let's make the assumption we're running our marathon. We're on the right course, right? We're doing the right activities. We're asking the right questions. We're calling on the right prospects. However, when we don't see the normal signs of progress and forward motion that we would associate with those selling activities at that level of work, it becomes a total mind game. We had two guys in this marathon that were sub three hour street marathoners. That's really, really fast for a marathon. They kind of went mentally like this, and they ended up going off course. We had to go find them on snowmobiles. <laughs> we didn't have tracking devices, so we really were not the smartest guys in the Antarctic. But we, were, we had a great time. I was loving this. I mean, there were times where that, I'm like, is it that way or is it that way? And everything looked the same, and I was by myself. And there was actually, confession, there was actually a part of me that really was hoping I was going to get lost. 
Remember, I didn't go down because I was some world-renowned marathon runner. I went down to follow in the footsteps of my hero, so I really wanted an element of difficulty and danger. I mean, I, I still think that way today. <laughs> so this is the finish of the 100 kilometers. I went back a year later because my wife thought, well, you know, she thought, well, he'll go once and get it out of his system. Well, not really. I mean, the, the, the treks continue. And I want to take you back to the freezer for just a minute because I learned some really important things that have everything to do with being a leader and being a, a, an effective salesperson who's growing a business. The thing that most people couldn't get over is this back and forth, right? They could kind of get over the fact that this wasn't a joke. He actually really did go in the freezer. And you can withstand the temperatures if you keep moving and you have the right stuff. You can keep warm. But they couldn't get over this. They're like, God, I just kind of picture that poor little hamster in the cage in the window of the pet shop just like, I just want to let the little guy out, you know? And I'm telling you, I learned something as a hockey player. I grew up in Philadelphia, and uh, I played hockey. And my coach said to me, he pulled me aside, I'm a 10-year-old, and he said to me, Mike, you will play the game the way you practice. And this was the real punchline. If you make the practice harder, game goes easier. Skate it away. That was 30-some years ago. And I can see him as vividly as I saw the guy sitting next to, next to me on the plane a couple days ago, because the impression was that great. And I thought to myself, if I can run a marathon in the freezer, this is the practice. If I make this harder, when I get into the real thing, it'll be that much easier. Because difficulty is all relative. Talk about going back to that photograph of separating what you can and what you can't control. My ability to change my definition of difficulty and my paradigm of how much is too much is totally within my control. If I make this harder, I look forward to this because I knew this was like building the muscle, the mental muscle. And I actually ran two marathons in that freezer before I showed up in the Antarctic, 59 feet at a time. 44 laps up and back was a mile. I had to measure it with a tape measure because a GPS doesn't work in a frozen metal box. And I would just stack buckets of ice cream to mark the mile markers and then build pyramids. And when I got 26 of them, which was five pyramids of five plus one and then a little bitty cup for the point two, I knew I was done. I had that thing measured to the inch. And I thought, if I can do this, I can do it in the real environment. And I thought to myself, you know what? Every single one of us has a ceiling. We have our own definition of difficulty. We have our own limits already set in our minds. If we don't like them, if we're managing people and we don't like where those are, we want to help them. We have to help people reframe the picture. Reframe the picture. This kind of stuff is like the daily monotony of activity that we sometimes don't like. The phone calls, the no's, the difficult problems with the difficult customers. If we look at those things, as opportunities to strengthen our mental muscle. That's like the resistance that tears the muscle down, right? As long as we're patient and we feed it the right nutrition, that's how muscles grow back together, right? Resistance, nutrition, and time. Those are the only ingredients of growing a muscle. Same way for this. All that selling activity, all those no's, all those problems are the resistance that tears the muscle down and enables the muscle to actually rebuild itself and regenerate and get bigger and stronger, right? You really become comfortable being uncomfortable. I actually really love that freezer. I just got used to it. I loved it. I still wish I could train there. To, they sold it to another company. They didn't want the liability. Right, go figure. Now, when you finish a marathon, this is very interesting. OK, like if one of us, let's say, for example, we run the Seattle marathon or a 10K or a triathlon. I'm sure a number of you probably have done you know, various events like that, what's probably the normal knee-jerk reaction question you get on Monday morning when somebody says, hey, what'd you do over the weekend? Ah, I ran the little, you know, the half Ironman or the sprint triathlon. What do you think most people ask? How'd you do? Measured by what? Time, exactly. What was your time? So I get back from this marathon in the Antarctic, and one of my buddies is like, oh, wow, that sounds really cool. Congratulations. What was your time? I kind of look at the guy like, Dude, I went halfway to the moon. <laughs> I lived in a freezer for a year. <laughs> Do you really think I cared about time? But then I stopped myself and I went, hold on a minute. There were nine of us. Not everybody really cared about following in the footsteps of Shackleton. Most of them didn't even know who Shackleton was. We had two guys who showed up only for one reason, and that was to win the race. We had two other guys who said, I don't care if I win or lose. I just want a particular time. And then I thought to myself, wait a minute. We have different definitions of a gold medal. If you're my coach and you make the assumption 
that how I define my medal is by time, you're a terrible coach for me. Because you're not understanding Mike's definition of a gold medal. The same holds true for the people that we lead and inspire and set the example for. We have to know how our people define their medal. As a leader, as a manager, we have to make sure that we take into account, yes, the marathon destination mark that the company wants us to get to, i.e. all the marathon runners are running to the same finish line. That's the goal of the company. Those are the metric numbers we have to hit, whether it's sales volume, numbers of new customers, margins, right, whatever that finish line is. But the reason why people will run when it gets really difficult is if we manage to their definition of their gold medal, not to ours, not making erroneous assumptions about what it really is that they're really running for. So the last story I want to tell you, I went to school in Boulder, Colorado. I was not a mountain climber, but I looked at my four-year degree as like a four-year conquest of Mount Everest. <laughs> and it had a very steep face. <laughs> I was not really a student. That was not my knack. And so I looked at this, and I learned a lot from these climbers. I knew a ton of these people that rock climbed. And I would ask them, like, aren't you afraid of heights? <laughs> right? That's kind of the normal knee-jerk reaction question we ask a climber. And their answer was, well, of course I was. And, they, and I'm like, well, they kind of stunned me. Like, well, how'd you overcome that? Oh, that was the hard part. But, but, but we did it by only teaching ourselves to look at the next handhold. We don't look down, it's too far to fall. We don't look up because it's too far to climb. And I thought to myself, there's the answer. Managing people's line of sight is a critical component to being a great leader. That's too far to fall, that's too big of a sales number to hit. Let's just manage it one class at a time, one assignment at a time one customer at a time, one phone call at a time. And everybody's going to have a different comfort zone in, how, uh, in the variance of that line of sight. Again, part of how we become an effective manager, we really have to know our people. We have to know what drives them. We have to know where their line of sight is. I mean, you really, really have to know people to lead them. So I'm thinking about all this stuff in this rock climbing. The analogies were amazing, whether it's to being a student or being in business. And you know, when everything's going according to plan, it's pretty easy to make decisions. Unfortunately, that only happens in cartoons and on paper. Because in the real world, things go wrong. And metaphorically speaking, people fall from their own mountains. In this case, this was literally someone who fell from a mountain. This was a, a story of a 125-foot freefall accident, which basically results in broken bones of 168 places. Now, the people who walk through our doors, who fly our flag, who represent ourselves, and, and who engage with our customers, okay, metaphorically speaking, they fall from their own mountains, right? Good news is most of the mountains people fall from are very small, and they're not very significant, and there aren't any consequences, much like earthquakes in California. There's a ton of them every day. Most of them are really small, and there's no damage. And so... You know, one of the things we have to do in, in, in leading people and inspiring people is we really have to condition ourselves to be optimistic. This is not the result of flipping a light switch. The light switch is only like the first 10 feet of the marathon. It's only the initial decision. Everything from that point that's going to predict whether or not we're going to be able to finish and stay the course, i.e., be able to recover after we fall from a mountain, whether it's literally or metaphorically, is a result of how well conditioned we are. All of the characteristics we talked about today, you've got to put those things into play, right? You've got to have an action plan. You can't just sit there and think, I'm going to get better, I'm going to get better, I'm going to get better, right? It's all about action. It's all about doing things that sometimes are quite uncomfortable, like getting back on a bike after the doctor tells you, you're going to probably lose your limb. You may not live. Who knows what's going to happen? We're going to do things to you medically that we have never done before to a patient. We've got to push the edge here. It's pretty scary stuff. See, now the irony is if you look at this person, if they were in here today, you'd never knew they fell because they don't look disabled. She ended up not losing any of her limbs, and as you can see, she looks pretty normal. The same way when people who walk through our doors, when they look and smell and sound the same as us, or if they look, smell, and sound normal, quote, unquote, we expect them to be normal. And the reality is this person suffers from a number of what you'd call invisible disabilities. They're very difficult to manage because when people have the same expectation of you that they have of themselves and of other people but you can't do it, it's really difficult to manage. 
This is where real leaders have to understand how to manage and lead the entire whole person, not just the worker. Shackleton exhibited that. If you're managing somebody with that kind of difficulty, like you see in the photographs, it's critical. And the people who walk through our doors every single day have varying degrees of different difficulties and disabilities that they're managing. And we have to be sensitive to those disabilities and those difficulties. Manage to those things. Understand those things. Understand their definition of a gold medal. Understand what drives them. Understand their line of sight that they can manage. And then be able to condition their muscles mentally by helping them reframe the picture, much like the points that we saw by that, that Ernest Shackleton set as an example for us 100 years ago in the Antarctic. Now, the reason that I can tell you that story from Colorado with such certainty and with such conviction is because that's my wife, Angela, of 23 years, June 2nd. Had to get it right. June 2nd. <laughs> and I will tell you that I learn a lot from Shackleton. I learn a lot from Angela. People who go through difficult and dangerous conditions, that's where the gold in the mine is. As long as we are managing to that, we understand that, and we take that into consideration as we inspire, as we lead, and as we really set the example for the people who follow us. Thank you again for having me. It's been a real honor and a real pleasure. Thank you.